Tonight we're starting a new series called My People, and we're going to finish this out over the next three weeks in this series, this teaching series, um, talking specifically um, about being thankful for the people that God has put in our lives. Obviously, we are past the season in our culture of Halloween. We're heading into Thanksgiving and Christmas. Anybody just curious, you started listening to Christmas music already. Anybody? Wow. Holy cow. That's awesome. Me too. Okay. I sent it to my staff, Alexis, Jacob, and uh, Rhonda, and they all, they all trashed me for it. Okay. But I'm listening nonstop, Sirius XM radio on my TV, uh, on my Spotify, all the, all the above. So, but Thanksgiving comes first. And so we need to talk about being thankful, believe that it's where we need to go in these last few weeks. I'm excited that next week a guy named Matt Kuhn is going to be speaking to you, sharing from his heart. I think he has a couple of kids in the room, and so um, that'll be fun for them. But uh, I'm excited for him to be here and talk about um, some things with this series. But here's the focus tonight is um, friendships, and the title of the message is Friend Like Jesus. And as I said, the series is about your people. It's about the people God has put in your life. Say, my people. So who are your people? Your people are the ones that you're closest to. It's the ones that know you the best. Maybe the ones you've spent the most time with. It's the ones probably, hopefully, that you trust. It's the ones that um, you enjoy being around. So when I think of my people, I think of my closest friends, my family, those who know me the best. So who are those people for you? Um, and as I said, we go into this season of being thankful. I believe that there are a lot of relationships in our lives, in your life, that you need to be thankful for, that we need to be thankful for. And being thankful isn't really something that you, that you just say. Like, I'm so thankful for isn't enough. Being thankful really is an action. And so the way I want to focus this series is that we are, are thankful through our actions for our people, for the people God has put in your life, for your friends, for your family, for those that you're going to be sitting around a Thanksgiving table with in a few weeks, for those you're going to spend Christmas with, and really that we live out this attitude. So like I said, tonight I want to start with friendships and how we can be a friend like Jesus. This really um, isn't a series or, or isn't a sermon tonight about how to find the right friends. This, this sermon is about how you can be the best friend. Somebody said to me one time, you know, um, friendships are tricky. I'll never forget that. I heard somebody say that um, from a conversation they have with somebody. And I thought, like, that makes no sense because I feel like, biblically speaking, in the Bible, friendships really aren't tricky. Like, when you have a biblical, Christ-centered friendship, now there might be bumps along the way. We're human beings. We fail. We mess up but they're really not tricky. They're pretty simple when you read the Word of God. When you look at people like David and Jonathan in the Old Testament who were best friends, who did life together. But what I do think is that friendships are interesting. Here's why I think they're very interesting. Because life, um, God, I believe, gives us lifelong friends, and I believe He gives us seasonal friends. I was just talking to somebody about this. Lifelong friends and friends for seasons. I'll give you an example. One of my lifelong, call them best friends in the world, almost like a brother to me, is a guy named CJ. I want to show you a picture of CJ. He is uh, my cousin. There it is right there. He is my cousin, and this is uh, at my wedding. He was my best man, and this was many years ago. Uh, I've been married eight years now, so a long time, feels like. Um, CJ and I have known each other for a long time, since we were apparently like four months old, um, because when he was born, I was four months old. We were cousins. We did life together, went to all of elementary, middle school, high school, um, didn't go to college together, but stay connected, and now we're friends today. These type of friends are the ones that no matter where you go, what you do, like as you grow up and you get older, you stay connected with these people. They're lifelong. You, no matter what happens, you can come back to them. They're going to know you the best. They're going to be there for you. Even though you might drift apart, you might live separate. Places do different things, have different interests. They got your back. They're always in your corner. This is, there's very few of those people. And CJ, my cousin, Curtis Jr. is what it stands for, is one of my lifelong friends. I have some other friends that have been a part of seasons of my life. Like right now, I have some friends in Spartanburg that are in this season of life for me. 
I have some friends that were in Houston that were in that season of life. And there's a guy who I want to show you, Ryan Herzog. Ryan is one of my great friends today, but we're not as close as we used to be. I don't talk to Ryan often. We're not as close as we were in this picture. This was probably six years ago, uh, standing in our student ministry room on a Wednesday night with all of our kids and all of our people at a big event that we had. And uh, we did ministry and served together. Ryan and I were so close. Went to lunch every day, talked all the time. In that season, God used Ryan in my life as a friend. So friends come and go. They're different seasons. You're going to see there's friends you have right now that you may not talk to. There's some in in college that you're going to get to know and then may not talk to. There's some that you're going to have as you grow up and become an adult. You move. You go somewhere else. Here's the truth about friends. No matter the season, friends are either making you better or making you worse. No matter the season, friends are either making you better or making you worse. An old youth pastor saying, you might have heard this before, is friends are like elevator buttons. They either take you up or down. And so I said I didn't really want to talk about that tonight But I do want to say, maybe your challenge tonight is that you need to not necessarily be a better friend, but you need to find better people. That you need to find people that are bringing you up, that are lifting you up, that are not making you worse, that are not leading you from Jesus, that are not causing you to be frustrated. Is there anybody in your life that you've trusted that you call a friend that's not pointing you in the right direction right now in your life? Maybe tonight you need to think about that. We call those toxic relationships. I read a whole book about toxic relationships one time. Awesome book. Reminded me of a few people in my life at that time. So maybe you have some of those people, and that's what you need to be challenged with tonight. But I hope that your focus is being a friend like Jesus. Okay, so I've told you I'm a Disney fan. You guys know that. Love the movie Aladdin. We talked about it a few weeks ago. There's a song in there called Friend Like Me, right? And this guy named Genie becomes Aladdin's best friend. He becomes his genie. He says, you ain't never got a friend like me. It's a song. And the reason he's such a great friend in this movie, that all of you probably seen, is because he grants wishes. He makes things happen and come true. What an awesome, great friend. But tonight I want to talk about a friend like Jesus, who is more than a genie. He is Lord and Savior. And so he gives us the perfect example of how to be a biblical friend of what that looks like. And so we're going to jump in. I want to show you four things in the next few minutes about Jesus and his people, the disciples. I know you've heard me say this before. The disciples were Jesus's core people. They were the inner circle. They were his main people. They were the ones he spent the most time with. By the way, Jesus had many disciples. He had many followers. But the 12 were the ones that he did life with every single day. And they were the ones who eventually led the church, right? So wow, how intentional was that by Jesus? He knew these 12, well, 11, were going to do something incredible. And so I want to talk about that relationship and how Jesus was, was the best friend. So that's our thought, how to be a friend like Jesus. Four points, we're going to go to some different points of Scripture And so the first point is this, if you're taking notes, Jesus saw the potential in his people. So we want to be a friend like Jesus. We want to love our people, love our core, love the ones in your life. First, Jesus saw the potential in his people. Let's look at Matthew 9. Just write down this reference if you want to. You don't have to turn to it tonight because we're going to hop around all over the Gospels. But Matthew 9 starting in verse 9, says this, As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. So Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked the disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, Is it not healthy, the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick? But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. What a crazy, bold statement by Jesus. For I have not come to call the righteous, but come to call sinners. Now you might read this and go, yeah, I know Jesus came to save people. I know he came for sinners, for broken. I I get that, okay? I've heard about Jesus, I understand. But I want you to notice, not what Jesus says at the end, 
But I want you to notice the call of Matthew right here. This was the first moment that Matthew joins Jesus' core. He joins the inner circle. Excuse me. <coughs> Biting off a cold. Um, this is where he joins the inner circle. And so he comes, Jesus, to Matthew in a very important place. And I don't want you to miss where he meets him. It says he comes to the tax collector's booth. That's important there. I don't know if you've ever noticed that before. Why is that important? Because notice where Jesus calls Matthew. He doesn't meet him in an alleyway. He doesn't meet him at his house. He doesn't meet him in a private area. He doesn't call him. He doesn't say, hey, I'll meet you when you're not in front of the crowd, when you're not being a tax collector. I will come where you are and meet you in the mess. Being a tax collector was not a good job. Being a tax collector was somebody who people did not like. Why? You may have heard this. Because they stole money. Number one, they were taking money from you and giving it to the Roman government. Not fun. Never fun to give the government money. Amen, adults? All right. Um, secondly, he was stealing money, taking money off the top from people, charging them too much. So this tax collector's booth was not the place you wanted to be. It was not a fun place. It's like going to the DMV. Anybody a driver? Anybody been to the DMV? Not fun, okay? Actually, the South Carolina DMV is the best experience I've ever had. But Texas and North Carolina, not fun. I've waited for hours. That was also uh, like 15 years ago, so maybe things have changed. But the DMV, I picture, is like the tax collector's booth. You don't want to go. The lines are long, all kinds of people. People are coughing on you. It's just like weird, okay? Um, but you got to do it if you're going to drive. So imagine going to the DMV if you've been there before. You're waiting in a line. It's inconvenient. You got to stand there. Finally, they call your number up. You go up there and they're like, hey, it's going to be $25 for your license. That's what it costs. But we're going to actually charge you $100 because we want more money. And you're like, no, I'm paying $25. Well, then someone who is armed comes out and says, no, yes, you will pay $100. And you're like, well, I guess I have to. That was what it was like. You went to go pay your taxes, which you didn't want to do in the first place, at a place you didn't want to be. And then they were taking money. So Matthew was a hated individual. And Jesus comes to the DMV in broad daylight, not in a secret place, not when he's overcome his sin, not when he's at church, not when he's talking to the Lord, not when he got saved. He comes in the mess. Why? Because Jesus saw the potential of Matthew. Jesus saw the potential of Matthew. Here's the truth I want you to know in this first point. Write this down. Your people need you to see them through the eyes of Jesus. So if you want to see the potential in people like Jesus did, your people need you to see them through the eyes of Jesus. The people God has put in your life need you to see them through Jesus' eyes. The way that he saw, the way that he thought, the way that he talked, the way that he lived. And the truth is that there may be some of you in this room right now who have written some people off in your life. You've written them off for whatever reason. They hurt you. They are involved in some kind of sin. They have turned their back on the church. You're like, they're never going to get saved. I can't bring them to church. I'm done. You've given up on them. But people need you to see them through the eyes of Jesus. So I want you to write this down in whatever you're taking notes on. If you're not, pull something out. I want you to put this in your phone or write this down. I'm going to say it first, and then you can write it down because I want to make sure you do it right. The people in my life need Jesus from me, not blank from me. And in that blank, I want you to put your name. So for example, for me, the people in my life need Jesus from me, not Seth from me. You people, my people, they don't need Seth. Seth is an angry, judgmental, broken, impatient human being. My people need Jesus. My daughter needs Jesus. My wife needs Jesus. My friends need Jesus. They don't need Seth. Here's where we get in trouble. When we start thinking your people need you. Nobody needs you. 
Jesus don't need you. He wants you. He wants to use you. So when you get in those moments, those selfish, fleshly moments with your people, be reminded, people need to see Jesus. I know I'm frustrated. I know I'm angry. I can't believe you did that. Our people need to see Jesus right now. How many times was that man betrayed? How many times was that man stabbed in the back? How many times was that man made to be a fool? How many times did people say something that he was like, I told you a hundred times, Peter, how do you not get it? Yet he still continued to love and forgive and give grace. What if people saw Jesus in you? And what if you saw people, not for who they were today, but who they could be if Jesus changed everything? Because he saw Matthew, a tax collector, man, I can change everything about you, not because of me, actually because of me, but because of God the Father who sent me to bring you salvation. So what if we saw people as what they could be if Jesus changed them? Number two, Jesus, golly, Jesus made time for his people. I need to get a better case. Jesus made time for his people. Number two, John 21, verse 10. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you've just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153 to be exact. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Verse 12, Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was Jesus. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This is now the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So here's what happens in John 21. The point here is Jesus made time for his people. The very end before Jesus is about to leave and go to heaven. He's come back to life. He's resurrected. He appears on a beach to the disciples. And they're fishing, which is what they normally do. Notice how the disciples went back to the old way of life. Jesus died. And they're like, well, I guess Jesus is dead and gone. And uh, we're hopeless. So let's just go back to fishing. When Jesus had just called them for three years out of that life. And now he's on a beach and he says, hey, come have breakfast with me. And notice here, they always eat bread and fish. Like I noticed that. I was like, do they eat anything else in the Bible? It's bread and it's fish. Like that's how they fed the, you know, the 5,000, the 4,000, always bread, always fish. Like doesn't that get old? And they're in this moment where Jesus chooses to have a moment with the disciples. He chooses to have breakfast with them after he's come back to life. So a few things to notice. Number one, it says they knew it was the Lord. It says the disciples dare not ask, hey, who are you? Because one time they asked, they thought it was a ghost. And Jesus rebuked them. Remember, Peter got off into the water and came after him and then didn't have faith and started to sink. So they're like, we know that's Jesus. I'm not going to say anything. Why? Because of the miracle. And they weren't surprised that he was there to meet them. Secondly, we notice, what does it say? This was his third appearance to them. So the writer here, John, makes a note that this was the third time Jesus appeared after he came back to life. So think about it. Jesus comes back to life. Salvation is done. History is complete. His job is over. Yet he stays. He stays on the earth. Why? I almost think, I don't know this is true, but I almost think that Jesus had a conversation with God the Father and was like, hey, I know I'm supposed to come home, but can I stay a little bit longer? Because I'm not done with these 12. 11. Because Judas, I'm not, I'm not finished yet. Jesus intentionally stays and makes time on three different occasions for his people. And what did he do? He didn't just make time for them. He gave them an opportunity to be with him. So here's the truth. Your people need you to make time for their time. Your people, it's tricky. Listen, your people need you to make time for their time. Here's what I mean. People don't just need your time. They need their time with you. It's a different way of thinking. People don't just need, sometimes we think, man, that person needs my time. And so I got to make it a calendar request or schedule. I got to talk to my parents. I got to make sure I'm not having practice or studying or going to church or hanging out with these people. I got to make time for that person. 
Well, instead of seeing it that way, what if we actually make ourselves available to the people who need us, who need your time? What if you are available and offer your time to the people in your life? Because Jesus never made appointments, right? Like we don't get a picture of Jesus standing at something like a tax collector's booth saying, all right, get in line today from three to four, I will heal you. So just get in line, come on down. No, Jesus just walked from town to town to town and he allowed interruptions. Do you allow interruptions? I'm gonna be honest with you guys. I'm so bad at allowing interruptions. I'm so bad at allowing interruptions in my life. I'm the type of person, maybe you're like me, when I'm working on something, I'm in the zone. Don't bother me, don't talk to me. But what if, now you got to have plans and schedules and all those things. That's a good thing. But what if you lived your life with your people knowing they could call you whenever. They could check in with you whenever. If they needed something, they can call you. Our pastor calls it 2 a.m. friends. That you were that type of person. That they didn't have to get on your calendar. They didn't have to check with you or make sure you were free and available. Man, you just, you were open to those who need help, who need you who want to talk to you, that's real discipleship. Discipleship is really just sitting down and having a conversation about Jesus and his word and what he's doing in your life. You got to be available to do that. The third one, Jesus didn't just make time for his people, but he spoke truth to his people. So you got, he saw the potential in his people, he made time for his people, and he spoke truth to his people. John 14, starting in verse, verse 1. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. If there were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you may be where I am. Verse 4. You know the way to the place where I'm going. John 14, verses one through four, if you want to write that down. Here's what happens. Jesus is in the Last Supper, upper room, the wine, the bread, the washing of the feet, Lord's Supper. And Jesus tells them, I'm about to go die. And the disciples are like, oh my goodness, really? Jesus is like, yeah, I've been telling you that for like three years, okay? But yes, I'm about to die in a few hours. Hello. And they're like, oh man, I can't. Jesus, what are we going to do? And there's this like negative spirit in the room. And so Jesus speaks up and he says this because they're devastated, they're emotional, they're shocked. And he's like, listen, there's a reason I'm going where I'm going and I'm going to see you again. Jesus spoke truth. And there's three main reasons he spoke truth in the Bible. He did it to rebuke people when he told Peter to get behind me, Satan. He rebuked people when he taught people and when he comforted people. In this situation, he comforted people. And notice here, when Jesus comforted his disciples, this wasn't like a, a false, exaggerated lie. Like sometimes when we comfort people, we feel like we have to kind of lie to them. We have to kind of exaggerate the truth sometimes. Oh, it's, it's going to be okay. Like, you know, we say that and like, well, really, no, it's not going to be okay. Like truly, like if I'm in a situation, I don't want somebody saying it's going to be okay because it really might not be. So what do we do? We got to be careful with the words that we say and how we say them. I believe people need us to speak what is true and what is promising. Here's what that is. Life giving words. Your people need you to speak life-giving words. Here's the truth. Write this down. Your people need you to speak life in the face of death. Your people need you to speak life in the face of death. When someone is in the face of death, when they're in the pit, in the valley, hurting, and they're your person. What do I mean by that? They're your friend. God has blessed you with them. They are in your life. You are connected. You trust each other. You have a relationship. They need life. They don't need, yeah, I agree. They don't need, yeah, it's going to get worse. They don't need, yeah, forget you. Yeah, I'm going to close the door. Yeah, I'm not helping you. They need life-giving words. Life-giving words are words that are true and words that are promising. 
words that are true and words that are promising. I don't know how many times you've said the wrong thing to somebody in the wrong situation. I do that all the time, especially in marriage. It happens. My wife's telling me something and I think I'm saying a great thing and it's not a great response. She needs life-giving words. People need life-giving truth. Here's the best way to speak life. To speak the promises of God. Jesus spoke truth to his people by speaking promises. People need you to speak promises of Jesus, of God in their life. So Jesus spoke to his people. The last one is this. Jesus died for his people. Jesus died for his people. This is the most important one, right? John 19, verse 30. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, vinegar, he said, it is finished, exclamation mark, and bowed his head and gave up his spirit. So Jesus not only spoke truth, he not only saw the potential, what did he do? He died for him. He died for his core. And guess what? You know this, if you're a believer, he didn't just die for his core, he died for everybody. He died for every single person. That's how Jesus was the ultimate friend. He sacrificed his life. And here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that you need to be willing to die for your people. I'm not saying that at all. I think it's foolish, yes, foolish for us to sit here and say, I'm willing to die for this, 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 this person. Are you really? Maybe you are. There's only a few people in my life who I'm willing to die for. I can tell you two. My daughter, my wife. That's pretty much it. I love you guys. But I got some people I got to take care of. So I'm not saying that. Here's what I'm saying. You got to be willing to sacrifice. You got to consider others before yourself. Philippians says, consider others. It says, put on the mind of Christ by putting others before yourself. We just talked about it on Sunday morning a few weeks ago. Being a friend like Jesus, it may mean you need to change the way you view friendships. Maybe tonight you walked in here thinking, man, I have friends in my life for what they can give me. Or you're looking for new friends in your life, new people in your life for what they can give you, for how they can benefit you, for how they can help you. But what if we viewed it differently? What if your motive for looking for friends was more about help than it was about have? Like, I want to find the people that no one else is talking to. I want to find the people that are different than me. I want to find the people that may not know Jesus because I'm all about helping and not about having. And the beauty of friendships is the blessings that come along the way, is how Jesus uses them along the way. So what does that look like for you tonight? Maybe tonight you're the person who needs to deal with some toxic relationships. I'm not saying don't do that. Do that tonight. Deal with that tonight. Begin that process. What does that look like? Come talk to one of us. I want to help you handle it. It's not just, just ending a relationship cold turkey, like, like just cutting someone out. It, it might need to be that, but, but before you do that, talk to somebody. You can really hurt somebody by doing that. Hopefully tonight, you thought about the people in your life. And over the next few weeks, I want us to think about the people in our lives. How can we show them how thankful we are? It's being a friend like Jesus. It's speaking to them like Jesus did, giving them a time like Jesus did, telling them truth like Jesus did, sacrificing like Jesus did. So what does that look like for you?